let's call it what it is. It's Seton Hall. Um, that was another close one we had uh, that we we dropped. Um, that probably would have been a loss tonight. But I think we grew up from this. Right. That's Juan Howard, Michigan basketball coach, after last night's uh, Michigan narrow win over Northwestern, saying, hey, you know, they will learn from last night's uh, victory, close victory. Uh, welcome in the Maize and Blue Review, TMBR. We have uh, Brandon Justice uh, on the screen along with Jim Scarcelli. It's great to have both of you guys here in, in the basketball game last night. We've, we've got a little bit of time to, you know, think it over or sleep on it and everything else. Uh uh, Brandon, let's just jump right in. What did, what did you think of the, the win here? Are you encouraged by what the Wolverines were able to do last night? Yeah, I, I think the tale of this team continues to kind of be consistent in that we're just really wanting to see to see some consistent, um, you know, something consistent, right? Because they're, uh, you know, they, they really impressed uh, with the win over Maryland. Uh, and then you, you had a close game here with Northwestern. It's probably a game you might have should have won by more or whatever you want to call it. Either way, you're just looking for this team to really find its stride. And with three wins in a row, you can certainly see that as a possibility. Um, but I don't think any of us are sold just quite yet still uh, on that. So with that in mind, I think that I just – I'm anticipating uh, – I think everyone is anticipating this weekend, obviously. And it's, it's, really, it's really proper. The timing could not be better. Uh, for this game this weekend as a, on Michigan side of things, because what better way to test yourself, uh, test your team, I mean, than to go up against your, your arch rival here, uh, Michigan State, uh, and see where they weigh out. Because that game last night, again, uh, similar to, to this whole run that they've had, um, you know, they had the really, really extremely impressive win at Indiana, and that one can't be understated. Uh, you know, however, I think that in their wins this year and through throughout their whole season, you know, so, sands the little phase of no basketball at all for like three weeks uh it's been a lot of leaving things to be desired and i kind of feel like that was what people took away from last night now granted now at this point in time people are just strictly looking for victories i think they don't really care how they come um so yeah but but in in summary i do think that we're still in that phase we're like okay all right well they're there they have a heartbeat so that's good uh but can they can they really reach that potential that we thought they were going to have. And I think we're going to find out this weekend uh, and see, see what happens. Scar, you're an old coach. Let, let me go back. You're a former coach. You know, you, would you rather have a game after it's all done that you, you win by 12, 15 points or uh, the value of winning one close that Joan was talking about there. And that sound we had at the beginning, a, a narrow two point victory. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, sometimes you like the blowout because you can play everybody. You always like to be able to play everybody on your team. Those That's great for confidence. You get to see kids, develop kids. It's also good uh, to play a game uh, which is a roller coaster, you know, test their uh, mental toughness. And we got tested mentally. You know, so th there's different types of games you'd like to have as a coach. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think the big thing is, you know, we're 17 games in. And now these freshmen – you know, they're now, you seeing them getting comfortable. That's the biggest thing I'm seeing. You're seeing confidence. Uh, we're smarter. We're playing smarter on defense. We're communicating better. Uh, the shooter, the shots are going in because they, again, 17 games in. Um, yeah, we, we are a totally different team. But, yeah, there's a lot of different types of victories you like to have as a coach, Danny. Sometimes you need to get those young guys playing time. But I would feel great if I'm a coach right now because they know they had a terrible stretch in there. They played real good. You know, first half was sound, and then they made pressure shots. This team can knows that they know they can go anywhere and beat anybody now after going on the road and, uh, you know, winning some good games against some decent teams. So at Michigan State, they got to feel confident as heck. Well, you know, Michigan blew some free throws there late. Uh, I like their their late game strategy of fouling Boo Booey with with four seconds to go. But then all of the little things that you talk about, you know, you, you need to get that block out, whether the guy's pushing you in the lower back or anything else. If you're Terrence Williams, and then you know the kid uh, Roper, he's from Orchard Lake St. Mary's. You know, he was the one that was open, or I don't know, not open, but he was the one that they kicked it out to for the three. I mean, uh, imagine that kid went through that scenario in his mind a few times, being able to walk into uh, the Chrysler center and beat the Wolverine. So none of that happened. So 
uh, you know, that's good that they're able to move on there. I, you know, uh, Devontae Jones is, uh, I, I think, a little bit under the radar in how he's playing. Caleb Houston's now had three games. They've won these three games, which is great. Uh, Caleb Houston's uh, doing a little bit better. His confidence, I know, you know, he told the crew last night, hey, you know, my confidence has never wavered. But, you know, he looks more confident. So, right. you know, those close games, I, I think that's going to help him, Brandon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you make a great point, Dennis. Uh, Devontae Jones and uh, and uh, Caleb Houston are two names to bring up because if you're thinking about it in the grand scheme of things, those are the two guys that we as a uh, media really expected to be the two key factors for this team. You know, Hunter Dickinson was 110% going to be this team's best overall player uh, from, from our perspective. However, we thought that those two additions, two new guys who we hadn't seen in a Michigan uniform, um, but those were two guys expected to really lead the way for this team uh, in the backcourt. And, you know, we really hadn't seen that up until this point. And now we're seeing it uh, three games in a row and they've won all three games. And in a big reason why they've won those three is because of those two in their play. And I think you make a great point with Jones, who's been, you know, tremendous in this little run here. Uh, and and uh, just in general has looked so much better than he did in the beginning of the year. Uh, Houston obviously draining shots. He couldn't miss if he tried at Indiana, and you really saw uh, what he's capable of doing as a shooter. What we were told Caleb Houston was going to be as a shooter uh, it has been the opposite of what he was in the beginning, but it's been the epitome of what he's been over these past three games, and whether or not that carries on is – it sounds elementary, but that will probably determine the outcome of the season. Uh, I don't know if anybody behind those two can really step up and play as big of a role as those two did and, and have over these past couple of games. Cause I don't know if anybody really has the uh, ability that those guys have to lead the court and to, you know, map out the court and then Houston to hit those shots. Uh, Frankie Collins is a guy who comes to mind as a guy who's been spelling really well. Uh, behind Jones and then if you think about guys behind Houston uh, you've seen it but again I think those two guys are a huge part of what happens is Dickinson absolutely um, but that's that's without question but I think that you made a good point in bringing up those two as being guys that are key parts of this run so far and will be key parts if this run continues we'll talk more about the game coming up on Saturday in East Lansing uh, Brandon Justice is going to join us here for just a, a question or two more so we've got uh, football to get to and recruiting, and I know uh, Scar had a question as well. Uh, Wednesday's National Signing Day, Andrew Paul, the running back from uh, from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I saw uh, Josh Connerly Jr. did a, an, an interview this week with rivals talking about Michigan and, and what he liked there. And then Michigan still does have the commitment in Cavante Henry. I, I, are you you feeling any anything new with any of these guys as the uh, the last week unfolds here and, and we get to National Signing Day, Brandon? So what we're really hearing uh, on Paul, we finally got a little bit of an update there with the whole Paul situation. And it's interesting because really Georgia's made itself a contender here and it's really hard to not want to choose Georgia right now for Paul. And ultimately I think that's where he goes. And it's, we were talking about this last time we talked about Paul with his explosion, his recruitment. Uh, when Michigan came along and offered him, they, he had offers, but Michigan stood out on that list. It, it was really one where not going to Michigan was going to be a hard thing to do in comparison to the other programs involved. Well, when he exploded shortly after that Michigan offer and a few other offers before it, uh, really, it's it's been hard to keep up with where his head's at, probably be, probably because it's been hard for himself to keep up where his head's at. Uh, and now we're starting to see a little bit clearer, and it does seem like Georgia is the trending figure here. And that stinks for Michigan fans, obviously, given that Georgia will have beaten them twice in 2022 if they are able to secure his commitment. Uh, it also stinks for Michigan because of the obvious uh, scenario here. Michigan's only got four scholarship running backs. It desperately needed to add another. It was it struck out on Trey Anum, who went to go be a linebacker at Ohio State. Uh, and so you, you really need to figure out the running back situation, uh, the scholarship situation. You might have to go to the portal. You probably will have to go to the portal or make a, a flyer offer here towards the end because it does seem like Paul is trending away. Um, but that that situation is fluid, so it could change. As far as Connerly goes, man, it, the interview, sure, absolutely. He talked because he was forced to. Um, but again, like very close to the vest, the circle is small and the circle is tight and it doesn't talk much and trying to figure out where his head's at is, is just as difficult. Uh, and it has been the whole time for him throughout his whole recruitment. And if you had to 
pick one way or another, like you're still really liking Michigan's chances, just given the longevity of its contention for them and how long they've been at the top for them as well. Uh, and now you're starting to see the Courtney Morgan situation at Washington kind of, yes, it plays a role, but it's kind of faded away. I think if, if again, I, th- I think I said this, I might not have, but I think I said this around the first signing day. If Michigan uh, or if Connerly would have uh, been forced to sign on that early signing day, I, I honestly believe he probably would have ended up at Washington. Um, but given how much time it's had to breathe and, and really Michigan's been able to you know, make its case here, uh, I do feel good about them with him. But that's but again, like we're, we're not going to find out. And I said this a couple weeks ago to you, we're not going to find out where his head's at until we're like real close. <laughs> and uh, and when we when we do find that out, you'll certainly see it on the den uh, because that situation is, is a big one for Michigan. They, they certainly uh, want and need Connerly in its offensive line room. The Wolverine Den, part of the Mason Blue Review posting board. Yeah, join up rivals, and you can see the uh, the blow by blow. If not uh, every second, certainly every minute. What's going on with recruiting up to National Signing Day? We got a question for Jim on some of those uh, rivals rankings, and I wanted to, to see if you had anything to say about Mike McDonald and the possibility of him going to the NFL and back to the Ravens. So, Scar, what's that question on the ranking? Well, um, I. Uh, I- my question was actually about something different. Uh, for, oh, go ahead. It, it, it's, Brendan, let me ask you this. I just wondered in your uh, in the in the conversations if you're hearing any any anything any role that, uh, that transfers in which schools are taking more transfers than others. If you're hearing anything uh, that it's it, it's a, it's become a negative thing for certain schools, or are, are you hearing that talk? Because you know I, I'm putting my hat on as a player, and I'm putting my hat on as a former high school coach. And as a former high school coach, I have to tell my kids everything that I knew about the school, you know, try to be unbiased and tell them everything I knew. That was my job to inform the kid, educate the kid. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, this transfer stuff, which schools are taking a lot of kids, which schools are not. Is it becoming a factor in recruiting? That was really the uh, the one big question I had for you. Yeah, I think a lot of schools are really taking a, you can kind of think about it like the draft almost where they're really going BPA like best player available when they see a guy out there who's super good they don't care what their roster looks like they want him in their program they're going to take them and they're going to embrace the competition if they lose some guys on the way out then no problem um, you know they, they're they're they know their roster needs to be at a certain spot on certain dates and they understand that when they take kids they inform the kid that's transferring along with the kids in the room and all of that, what the situation is, how they handle it is internal and probably won't ever truly leak unless somebody comes out and says something like the athlete uh, or something along those terms. But uh, it does come a point where you have to have those conversations with the kids and it's like, Hey, I don't force it. Like a lot of times you'll see them take kids uh, from the portal and then they'll go out in spring practice. And then after spring practice, they'll typically sit down and be like, Hey, I don't think this is going to be a place where you're going to play a lot this year. Uh, And then you'll start to see kids leak out. So like, for example, if a school were to take a, like Caleb Williams, who's probably going to end up, let's just say LSU. And this is completely hypothetical. This part say LSU has six quarterback in its room, six quarterbacks in its room. And it takes Caleb Williams. Well, seven quarterbacks is a lot of scholarship quarterbacks, right? You're not going to keep them all. You got to trim at least one Uh, with Williams. there, a young guy. You'll probably trim two or three of uh, because you're probably going to have a couple upperclassmen there Uh, those guys typically go compete in the spring and then use their spring film to transfer uh, and and go elsewhere and that's typically how it works out as far as the the negative side of it I mean absolutely I think everything in college recruiting has a positive and a negative anytime you're taking I mean Michigan took what seven or eight dbs this year and it's 22 class there might have been six or seven between safeties and corners Uh, you know that's going to be one of those things where you're probably going to see some guys leak out there after too uh, and so I don't think it's negative uh, necessarily. Um, I do think there is, like anything else, uh, an abuse of it where you're taking far too many and you're putting kids in unfair situations. And that may lead to uh, situations, like you said, that, that turn negative where the, um, I don't know, the optics of it will begin to look bad. And maybe something doesn't come out or the story doesn't come out, but recruits talk and alumni talk and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, I think like anything else, there is a possibility of, uh, of of an abuse thing here where it's just overused and then you see people negatively react to it um, and because kids are getting pushed out because of it at certain schools. And which is funny. Why is it funny? Because we all remember the meritocracy era in like 2015, 2016, when Jim Harbaugh was pretty much buried for the 
Eric Swenson situation. And now it's like Eric Swenson would be one of 1,000 this year that going through the similar process. So it's, it's interesting, to say the least, how the goalposts have moved over the past few years. All right. Uh, speaking of moving, I know you have to be on the move there. We see you in your car, but we wanted to ask you about Mike McDonald. I, I, if you feel like Michigan might stay in house, you feel like they could uh, go elsewhere to bring somebody in. I mean, all of those different things, uh, scheme change. Antoine uh, sending a message here saying he's interested to see who Michigan's uh, defensive coach or coordinator will be. Uh, probably the guy we got from, from Notre Dame that is uh, an alum, former player. He just hates that Michigan – will have to change schemes. And he also mentions uh, McDonald uh, in, in recruiting. So a, a lot of different things there. I, are they going to change schemes, a chance that they go outside, they stay inside? I mean, what, what do you think? Take a stab at that one. Is that for me, Denny? Well, let's go to Brandon because he's got to go, and then we'll come back and we'll ask you. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so I don't think Michigan changes its scheme. I think Michigan loves the scheme it went out with last year for obvious reasons, and it has a staff – a defensive staff filled with guys who can execute that scheme and believe in that scheme. And it's got a, a room, a roster filled with guys who fit it. And it recruited uh, guys who fit it as well. So I don't think Michigan changes its scheme. Now, that being said, like it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's an absolute. There is a possibility that, that someone, whoever, whether it's internal or external, comes in and they have their system and that system is different than McDonald's uh, if McDonald truly does officially leave. Uh, with all of that in mind, though, if it if it is Mike Elston, the Notre Dame uh, guy referenced there, or if it is George Hilo, or if it is Steve Klinkscale, then I truly believe internally that it would the scheme would stay. I mean, they all learned it over the past year; it worked tremendously. Why would you change it? I, personally, that's where I'm at with it. Uh, if it's an external hire, which I think is the more unlikely situation, if Michigan wants to go make a splash like they did with McDonald, who really wasn't viewed as a splash at the time, um, then that guy might come in and overhaul things similar to how McDonald did. But when Michigan was moving on from Don Brown, it was exactly that. It was moving on from Don Brown. Whoever was, come in, whoever was coming in was tasked with a scheme overhaul. That's not the case here. Now, if, if McDonald leaves, he leaves with good graces. Not that Don Brown didn't, but he leaves with good graces. He leaves um, he leaves the defense better than he got it, and it's different with that in mind. So I think whoever takes over would be wise to keep going what he's built so far. Good stuff, Brandon. Uh, back to the den or wherever you're doing, driving around out there. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, we will uh, talk some recruiting with you uh, tomorrow. All right, uh, Scar, what about Mike McDonough? How big of a loss uh, would it be for people that don't know and might be watching for the first time? All throughout the uh, the year when we were on the post game, you like you 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 didn't hide, you know you, your um your like for the uh, defensive coordinator, the the young thirty four year old uh, DC that came from the Ravens and and had his scheme there. So uh, I'm guessing you think this is going to be a pretty big loss uh, that Michigan if if McDonald like expecting him to uh, go to the Ravens. Danny, I can't under, understate how important this uh, is. I, I think so much of this guy, a, a, a head coach has to be great at evaluating talent of the coaches and players. And you got multiple hats you got to wear. But that that hire is the most important hire Jim Harbaugh ever had. And he hit the jackpot on him. I think so much of this guy that I don't know that with Durkin, Madison, or uh, Don Brown, we win a Big Ten championship. I really would have my doubts. I think that much of this guy. Um, our scheme changed. I, I could tell the first game of the year that we were going to be sound against the run and we were going to be strong against the pass. And uh, our guys were playing with great technique. I found in coaching, it's easy to find. It's easy. It's. It's. I don't want to say it's simple, but it's easier to find guys that can teach blocking, teach tackling teach coverage, teach teach uh, running the ball, throwing the ball, those things, and, and guys that can motivate and guys that can recruit. You can find those guys, guys that can motivate, recruit, teach technique, all those things. But the guy that can scheme, the guy that when you coach against some guys, you say, I hate going against that guy because he gives me problems. He gives me problems regardless of talent. He's hard to defend. He gives, he's a schematic headache. The kids are well coached, good technique, but there's also a lot of stuff that gives me problems. 
And I also know from the defensive side, you say, oh, you know, there's coaches that say, okay, I like, I don't, I don't want to go against this guy because they're very well coached. They give me problems. They do a lot of stuff. They, 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 they create confusion for our offense. This guy had us, I think, on all levels. Great technique. Guys were in the right spots. I didn't know which game week to week they were going to be in, what front, what scheme. And the same thing with the offensive people that had to play us. So I, I truly am disappointed. I understand sometimes, Denny, these guys don't like to recruit. Maybe he wants to be a head coach at the, in the NFL. But Jim has got to find a guy uh, that I, I totally believe in the scheme. The scheme is sound. The scheme has worked for the Ravens. It's gonna it worked for us. We gave an Iowa three freaking points. You think that was just players? That wasn't just players. We gave Ohio State 27 points. It's both. It's players and coaches. But Clinchdale in his contract has wording that he is is you know is is either gonna be a co-coordinator. So, you know, hopefully they can find if it's him. And, and he believes in that scheme. But, but, boy, I really hope they believe in that scheme, continue it, uh, and, and, and tweak whatever it is they have there. Because every sometimes coaches want to put their little touch on things. But the good coaches always go with the philosophy, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's how they keep their program going from year to year if they don't, you know, if they change coaches. But I threw a lot at you. I love the guy. I hope we change the scheme and just have different people running it. Yeah, well, you know what? McDonald spent seven years in the pros and, and one in, in college. So, you know, the the idea that he always wanted to be a pro coach, I mean, I, I, I could see that. I could feel that. You know, the thing about uh, Clink, uh, Clink scale, if, um, you know, it's and, and Harbaugh's known about Jim Harbaugh's known about this, John Harbaugh as well, uh, for a while. So, you know, he, he probably already knows what he's going to do here. But, I mean, uh, you know, last year's with uh, with Hutchinson and Ajabo, if that scheme really fit them. It, now you have a more of a blank canvas here. What if Clink says, you know, our personnel more is fitting back to uh, a, a four three, or if Elston, I mean, if his if his if his entire time, and I actually don't know what the defense there. I'm thinking Notre Dame, the right. four three. I mean, it is. Uh, can you force yourself if you're a coach that's never coached in that, you know, to now be the a defensive coordinator of a three four? I guess the the question to me is it a, a scheme personnel? Or a, a scheme that a defensive coordinator is familiar with, uh, you know, I'm sure Jim Harbaugh would be a great question for him. Uh, what he's looking at there. What do, What do you think about, uh, you know, the scheme or the personnel? I know you just said you you hope they stay the same here, but what if they don't have the personnel for it? No, they have the personnel, Denny. They have really, really good players. Uh, they, they, I saw the backups. They're, they they got guys that can fill in for Hutchinson or Jabo. They, they just got to get the reps. They got to get, you know, more. And we talked about Brendan McGriff. Those guys are sound, good athletes. Uh, we've got players, secondary, that can plug right in and execute that scheme to perfection. Uh, and, I, and I've got to believe the coaches on that staff, they've got to be believers in, in what, we, what they did defensively. And what they did defensively, though, is they have a defense that can adjust to all different types of offenses. That, that defensive scheme, you know, allows you to do different things against what, you know, what did, what did Iowa do, which was so different than Ohio State, totally different offenses, you know, and, um, you, you know, so you have to be able to adapt and adjust is what the great defensive coaches uh, have the ability to do. And what we did this past year enables them to do that. So I, I would just, I do believe they have the talent. And I got to believe those coaches have, uh, know how uh, McDonald implemented it, how he uh, uh, taught it, how they uh, d- decided on their game plan. And I got to believe they're all believers in it. Just, But like I said, every, every coach is going to want to have, uh, you know, they all have coached 15, 20 years. So they got a whole lot of different stuff in their mind uh, to be the guy to pull the trigger now. It was McDonald who had the, the final say, you know, Clinksdale, Bellamy, you know, Nua would have suggestions about, you know, what we want to do against, uh, uh, you know, Northwestern, or we should do this against Washington, or we should do that. And that's how I, you know, I understand that. I always had, had my coaches, we would discuss things. and But the, the head guy's got to make the decision, you know, and when people are suggesting we should do this, that, or whatever. And, um, and uh, ho- hopefully, 
you know, hopefully it would be Clinksdale and he, you know, he understands what we did and he knows how to develop, you know, implement it. And uh, that, that we just keep rolling, man. We don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, Denny. No, I hear you there. Antoine with a, a question. He said he heard that uh, Elston was a great recruiter. So he thinks that will play a big part in him as a, a defensive coach here. I, you know, Elston, since Harbaugh's known about this the whole time and they had that some of that, you know, the contract becomes uh, public. I saw it out there and it mentioned doesn't mean that he's not going to be the defensive coordinator, but it looks like, you know, that was a higher, you know, for Elston to be on uh, as a defensive line coach, not as a defensive coordinator, not saying that he won't be bumped up there, but that's at least the way it looks right now. Yeah. I don't know how that's playing out, but you know, you know, Antoine, if, if Antoine, Denny and Scar are coaching a defense for a local team, and, and, and Denny say you're the coordinator and I'm coaching the D-line and Antoine's coaching the secondary, We us three are going to discuss things. We're going to look at film together. We'll figure out who their players are. What do they do with these certain players? What do they do out of certain formations? You know, what do they do down in distance? And together we will just devise a game plan. We'll throw suggestions at you. You know, and, and that's how a coaching staff works together. And then, like I said, you you you're the, you would be the guy that would have to make the final decision. So Mike Elston, you know, I don't know what his role is going to be, but if he's a D line coach, he'll just be another voice in the room, bouncing stuff off. Because you you know you can never have enough eyes to see, you know, what is a team doing. I had my key guys that I coached with, and we would discuss things, and one guy would see something you know that I didn't see, or I would see something that he didn't see, and maybe we should emphasize this. We got to take away that. This kid isn't that good. Let's focus on this. So you you you, you batter back and forth, you know, to devise your game plan. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that one plays out. Uh, let's uh, switch it over a little bit to the uh, to the players right now. They're into uh, what do you call this? The the winter phase. I I, I saw AJ Henning uh, posted something on TikTok about, uh, some of the workouts that he was going through. It was a, it was a funny little minute deal about all the different things, uh, running and shuttling and lifting that he was doing. I mean, uh, what's going on right now? I mean, is that, the, it's just, uh, hitting the weights running, you know, you know, they have school or anything, but, uh, football wise, I mean, that's uh, what they're concentrating on here in the winter phase. You know, Denny, what, what's going on right now? It's, it's, it, 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 does, it doesn't seem to get a lot of talk, but it's vitally important. You know, and I remember reading how much money Saban was paying his uh, strength coach and how much money uh, Urban Meyer was paying his strength coach. And I played, when I played, we had a legend. Mike Gittleson was one of the first strength coaches in the country. And I understand how important that position is. And, and Jim's got a real good one. Ben Herbert is good. He's a good strength coach. And this is Ben Herbert time. This is when that guy is earning his money right now. And, and, and this is when you're really starting to develop, to develop the, the team too, though, big time. These guys are running together. They're lifting together. They're doing things together. And, and you're starting to get that camaraderie and that, and you're, you know, they'll have team meetings, even though there's conditioning going on, Coach will get together with the kids maybe every two, three weeks, see what's going on. But you're gonna you're you're in that team meeting room now and you're looking around and you're like, okay, Hutchinson ain't here anymore. Haskins ain't here anymore. Ross ain't here anymore. And you got this full team meeting and you're you're starting to see a pecking order start to develop again. You know, who's gonna sit where Hutchinson used to sit in that in that auditorium type room they have? Who's gonna sit here? Guys are going to move up, and you, you, it's just a, uh, you know, it's a unique deal that's going on, um, and, uh, you know, you're starting to see that team building that starts in the weight room. It isn't just show up uh, on, um, you know, on the first uh, spring practice, but you also have high school kids in there, which is different than when I play played, so that's that's kind of interesting. You've got some transfers coming in, so you've got some new faces that you know they don't know these guys and and they got to get the, get a feel for people uh, and you know and they're getting to know they're getting to see who really works hard who runs hard who lifts hard and you know and and that all pays a you know it adds to the respect you have for different players and you don't want to be a guy to let your teammates down but you want 
but also individually now, every player, yeah, you want you're you're concerned about the team. You want to be respected by your teammates, but individually, every guy is fighting like crazy to get in great shape so he can get himself uh, in a position to compete for a you know a starting job, a backup job in spring football. So everybody mentally is going through conditioning, you know, trying to get in great shape and, you know, and, and try to see where they, they fit in, um, you know, getting ready to go for spring football. What are the quarterbacks do right now? You mentioned all that working out and everything, you know, the Harbaugh and Gaddis and Matt Weiss, you know, they can't be down there. I don't think in the practice facility with them, you know, uh, evaluating their throws, but I don't know, maybe there's some tape that they could put on and, and watch these guys. I mean, they, 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 they throw in the, to the wide receivers, some routes. I mean, are the, are the competition on, uh, you know, there, there are a hundred footballs being thrown a day and are they being graded on that? Uh, what, what do you think? Like uh, everybody's like, well, we got to let them compete in spring, but, but right now with those QBs, are these guys can competing is somebody going to be able to make a move one way or the other, if they're out there and if they're just working on their own or with the wide receivers, you know, Danny, when I played, you were not allowed to do those things with coaches or without coaches. You were not allowed to do like seven on seven type work. And I don't know what the rules are now. If, you know, if JJ can call the guys and say, I know in the, in the summertime, you, it is allowed. It's, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, work that they can do without coaches. It has to be player led high school. We got the same thing, certain rules, it's got to be player led. You can't be coaching them. Okay. Right. Now I don't know what the rules are now with uh, with the NCAA and how much work kids can do that's player led. So I, I do believe it's going on. I do believe uh, there's some there's some passing going on. I just don't know how structured it is. And um, you know, I've been out of it for a while. We, it wasn't allowed when I played. Yeah, you know, it, it comes down to one of those things. I mean, if it can't be in, in your facility, then, you know, they can go over. I'm sure they could find a spot, you know, somewhere where that can go on and, uh, you know, that part. Let's go back to some of the things that we talked about. If we, we missed any ground here, we've, we've been over Mike McDonald here and uh, talked about the, the winter conditioning. So, you know, it's back to basketball and what Michigan did last night and they've won three in a row and now they go – and they take on Michigan State, and I was just looking. There's, you know, there's there's two things here. They've uh, they've come up with a, a reschedule for the Purdue game. That was one of the games that they missed, and that's going to be on February the 10th. That's a uh, a Thursday. So when you start counting uh, this upcoming game against Michigan State over the next two weeks, actually 15 days, six games in 15 days for uh, for Michigan, including Michigan State, two times. You know, Purdue was in there. Uh, Wisconsin's involved in one of those games too. So it's going to be a real gauntlet uh, for them. Uh, they have there, uh, you know, the, the thing about the close games, when you look, you know, Juwan Howard mentioned it a little bit. You you go back to the Seton Hall game, Michigan lost by two points, Michigan in all of their wins this year, uh, they've all been blowouts. They, they, they haven't in, in the close game, uh, you know, or they've got blown out themselves in the losses. Uh, you could look. The Rutgers game was an was an eight point. Uh, uh, they they stayed within single digits, but this even traces back to last year. They didn't have many close games. There was a, a three game stretch where it was uh, uh, Wisconsin and uh, Ohio State, uh, where they they were in the single digits. But all the other games that they won last year, they were all blowouts. Their first loss that they had when they went to Minnesota, they lost that one by twenty. Uh, they haven't been in a lot of, I think the point here I'm trying to make is that I, they haven't been in a lot of one possession games late where they've had success. You think about when they lost to UCLA, I mean, that was a, a one possession game, you know, of uh, two points and it, it, it ended up, we know they had those shots at late. They lost the big 10 tournament to Ohio state. They lost that one by one point. Uh, there haven't been a lot of, uh, there hasn't been a lot of success for Michigan in these games where it's come down to, real executions in the, in the last five, you know, three, two minutes of the, of the game. So maybe it is valuable last night that they'll be able to do and, and have some success there. And, and that will help them now that it's passed, uh, even in a game coming up like uh, Saturday against Michigan state. Yeah. Hey, Danny, we're all creatures of habit and the more stressful pressure situations you put the, a guy in, he's going to be able to handle it better. 
you know, I, I firmly believe that's why we're we're playing smarter, we're shooting better. We're 17 games in. These guys are you know, they've done it now for a good amount of time. We're playing smarter defense and and uh, and we're making shots because we're confident. And um, but yeah, I, those close games are good. And I was concerned about Caleb Houston making shots when we're up 20. Or can, you know, can can Terrence Williams make it when it's when we need a bucket? And we did that yesterday. That's why that was such a great win. But listen, Michigan State is is I, I watched them play many times this year. They got big time turnover problems uh, like us yesterday. They have their games where they're going. You know, Izzo's going nuts, and and, and they they have been prone to do that. Are they going to do that against us? Are we going to cause those turnovers? Hopefully, we can. Um, but uh, you know they they've got uh, they got good players. You know Bingham is a guy that uh, he makes mistakes. He's he'll, he'll I think Hunter Hunter has has played pretty well against him on that low block. I don't know if Bingham has the uh, has the enough enough meat on him for for Big Hunter. But um, you know uh, yeah that uh, that scheduling. I was wondering how that was going to play out. So we we've got the Purdue game scheduled. Hopefully we have at least a day you know, in between there, a rest. But I think with so many young guys, and, and Juwan plays, a, we do play a lot of guys. If we got a one-day rest deal, I don't think that's much of an issue at all, playing, uh, you know, six games in 15 days or whatever that was. I, I think because, again, we play guys, they're young. Uh, man, they can, they can bounce back. You know, people don't even think about that when you're in the Big Ten tournament playing four days in a row. So, Good point. We play, you know, we play enough guys. Uh, depth is uh, is not going to be, a, you know, that's not going to be an issue. Yeah, hopefully their instructors, uh, you know, give them a break on some of the schoolwork. You know, the Michigan State's interesting. Watching them over the last week or so, they uh, they come back. They're 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 down big against Illinois. They come back. They could have won that game. They they blew some free throws uh, there at the end. I watch them. Uh, what was it last Friday? They go into Madison and they just. Uh, they look fantastic. Uh, the guard play all the way. They got they got three really good guards. Two of them up at the top of the Big Ten in assist. I mean, everything you're looking for there. You're like, man, Izzo. The, the wings are playing awesome. You mentioned Bingham. You know, Christie is uh, you know looks like a a, a a lottery pick when it comes to the NBA draft. But then you know they they lost to Northwestern at home, and the refs tried to give them the game there in that one. Two big time questionable calls. Not somebody that looks at the referees and, you know, I, I know what a tough job it is last night. They were whistle happy and everything else, but you know, it, it was, there were egregious calls there against Northwestern late, but Michigan state, you know, uh, they, they blew a free throw in that game too. And I'll tell you, they got the win against Minnesota, but I'll tell you what, I, I don't know how many people are talking about this, but uh, Max Christie, the, the outstanding freshman, he totally travels before he throws the ball to Hogart who makes a really nice pass. Uh, to Hauser, who ended up uh, hitting the layup at the end, that that big win that they had. But there should have been a traveling call there. Gopher should have had the ball with four seconds at the very least. They could have been going to overtime here. So as good as Michigan State looks and everything else, they're missing free throws. They turn the ball over, like you said. And Michigan does have the decided advantage when it comes uh, at the center position. You know, all that being said, I don't expect them to win on Saturday. But, man, you they want to change perception like – I'm looking at them, and, and I think most people are like, wow, this is – they've got work to do to even put themselves on the bubble. Uh, it's more likely that they won't be in the tournament, that they will, uh, you know, when you start looking at these games and everything else. But uh, the, a perception changer would be a signature win coming up on uh, Saturday. Yeah, I, I guarantee you Michigan is not intimidating. I, I, I've said, you know, like Izzo's a great coach, long time, and – this is not a great Michigan State team. They're good. Michigan's good. We're not a great team. We're, but we've gone on the road and won, man. We, are we going to shoot the ball like we did at Indiana? You know, just yeah, like – got to shoot well. Got to shoot well, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's so much of it comes down to that. We'll, we're going to get shots. They're going to get their shots too. You know, which Michigan State team is going to show up? The, you know, the one that, that didn't miss uh, – so it's it's the same thing, man. But we 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 play good. We're playing good defense. I, I we have I have every bit of um, uh, I have faith that our guys will be confident. I, we have every opportunity to win this game. Give That's me the key, Scar. People want to know the key Saturday. What's Jim Scar selling? Coach, you, you, you play the game. You're looking at you know this rivalry game. I put way. I mean, I, I don't put too much into it, but I put a lot in the rivalry games and this particular one against Michigan State. 
and going on the on the road here. I have my idea what the key is. I mean, you hinted around at shooting. You got anything more specific? You well, know? yeah. Listen, when you play Michigan State, Tom Izzo is uh, he 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 focuses on a few. You got to get back on defense because they try to get easy buckets. They they don't want to make the game about making you know, 20 footers. They want, you have to get back on defense. They will push everything, every made shot, every turn. They will push, push, push. So you got to get back on defense, number one. And the second thing they do a great job of is rebounding. They beat up the boards. They emphasize rebounding on both sides of the court. Uh, You know, they get more second shots. The last 20 years, Izzo emphasizes it. You know, I, I heard a great coach by the name of Brady Hoke. Yeah, he said it the first time I heard it. You get what you emphasize. You get what you emphasize. Izzo emphasizes fast break. He emphasizes rebounding. So those are the two things you start with. If I'm coaching Michigan against Michigan, you bet. Like, like you talked about last night that, I mean, if I'm coaching Terrence Williams, I'm – Furious because he allowed that guy to shove him under the basket yesterday. And Michigan State will do all of that stuff. And the same thing with Folds on the last. I don't know if you watch Folds. That Northwestern kid, uh, he swam, swam around him, got position, took position from him. Luckily, there wasn't another two seconds on that clock because that kid got that rebound. We would have lost the game there. But Michigan State brutalizes the glass. They, they focus on it. That's the two things I would focus on. Look, just let's play smart, not turn the ball over. Let's let's make them be the team turning it over and, and just do what we've been doing. Uh, do, let's do what we did at Indiana. But those are the two things I would start with. Well, uh, Hunter's going to be there, and, and you, you emphasize what you're going to be able to do. Well, that's my Brady Hoke. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would put it on, uh, on Hunter Dickinson if I'm looking for a key here. Now, Michigan's going to run their offense through him. And, you know, he, he can't pick up uh, blocking fouls. He can't pick up uh, fouls on screens. They're going to go at him. They're going to need – they need him to be a rebounder. They need him to be a scorer. They need him to be a facilitator. And when Michigan has go- played well through these uh, three games, not so much last night, a, a little bit at the beginning, but certainly the uh, the game at Indiana where, you know, Dickinson was awesome and then the game before against Maryland, they get him the ball and he's making quick decisions. He's kicking it out. They're swinging it around. You know, he, he's making his hooks. He's he's driving to the basket, you know, and he's getting fouled. You know, to me, that's the key. And you're right. You know, Michigan State, they're going to be in their jock. They're going to know what flavor Michigan's gum is and, and all those kind of things. They play with that intensity. And Izzo demands that they're going to, you know, guard. So, you know, when I hear Juwan Howard talking about uh, folds and, and uh, how, um, you know, Jace Howard was diving on the floor against Illinois and how Diabate was doing it, you know, against Maryland, diving out there. Uh, they got to sell out. And there was – I didn't see the sellout uh, defensively against Northwestern. Maybe it had a little bit to do with, uh, you know, how they run their sets and everything else. But uh, Michigan needs to be ready to sell out when they go up there. But Hunter Dickinson, he can be the difference. And if Michigan wins that game, you're going to be talking about Hunter being dominant. I don't think you're going to be talking about, well, you know, Hunter had to go to the bench and other guys picked it up. It's going to be that Dickinson – uh, was the best player on the floor. And you know what? He can be the best player on the floor. And, you know, that'll change the perception of this team. If they, yeah, you know, the, you know, they the, 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 well, the big, one of the big things is we're going to see what Izzo's plan is defensively. Is he going to leave Bingham alone on Hunter? Okay. I would guess that they're going to look at who's on the floor for Michigan and which guys can they leave to go try to double on him. He's going to pick their moments to try to double him. But if, if Hunter can have his way with Bingham, um, you know, then he's going to have to double, and then that's going to set up our shooters again. And them guys got to make shots, but we'll see what their what their game plan is. You know, with Frankie Collins in the game, if I dump the ball down to Hunter, I'm leaving Frankie Collins to try to help out. You know, if, if Brendan Johns is in the game, I'm leaving him to try to help out, but I'm not leaving Houston. I'm not leaving Brooks. I'm not leaving Jones. So we'll see what uh, Izzo's game plan is. Yeah, well uh... – uh, scoring is going to be the name of the game. Uh, you can say it always is, but uh, being able to make some shots, obviously, and I think that does run through the big man. All right, uh, we covered it all here. Scar, Michigan basketball, McDonald, and uh, how big of a loss that will be. Uh, we've had the recruiting spotlight. Brandon Justice was on here talking about National Signing Day, and uh, you went over uh, winter conditioning. So we have covered it all. 
Now we just wait for that game coming up on uh, Saturday. You got a final thought? You know, you know, something I didn't cover in, in the winter conditioning is the mental mindset of Michigan. I, I, I see it in my notes. I just want to talk about it briefly again, Denny, because I played on a team that had won a Big Ten championship, and I understand what, you know, the offseason was like there. I also played on a team that had – Coach Schimbeckler's worst year finished six and six or six. Yeah. Six and six. And I understand. And I remember that mentality where everybody was pissed off. Coaches were pissed off. Everybody was pissed off that whole winter conditioning and spring football. So this team, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering where the mind is because yeah, we did a lot of real good things. You know, we beat Ohio state, but we lost to Michigan state. So we're pissed off about that. Yeah, we won a Big Ten championship, but we got beat by Georgia. So I think the mental, uh, the mindset of our uh, of our team is probably it should be in a real good position because we should feel confident that we can win a championship, but also pissed off that we lost to some people we didn't uh, we you know we didn't want to lose to. But uh, Denny, I got my memorable minute. If you want to jump into that. Oh, yeah, the memorabilia minute. We take a piece of uh, memorabilia somewhere out there, and we talk about it for one minute. So the memorabilia minute, what do we got there? Is that Sparky? That's Sparky and Coach Schembechler. Can you see that? Uh, Yeah, yeah, I see it pretty good. There's old uh, uh, Glenn. What was the Sparky's real name? George, I think. Glenn and George. George, So you know I worked at Tiger Stadium. I ran the security there, and I got to know a lot of those guys. And – and um, they, I used to, I, I used to be a fly on the wall at times when I heard, I heard Bo and Sparky talking, and it was interesting. The, they really got along with each other. They respected each other. And um, the, the couple of things though that may, people might not know is Bo was instrumental in getting strength training into the uh, Detroit Tiger baseball organization. Sparky was old school, man. We don't lift weights, you know. We we swing the bat, we throw. We don't want to get bulky and ball was able to convince them. And a lot of that had to do at, at the same time, Michael Jordan was, was strength training. So I remember talking to C- Cecil Fielder, Alan, Tr- cause I was down. I got to know some of those guys, Alan Trammell. And, and uh, initially they were kind of reluctant, but then the, those guys really bought in. So strength training, I was shim back. But another thing, uh, Danny, that uh, Bo brought into the Tigers was the use of videotape. They used to, um, videotape their their at bat the previous at bat they they could videotape there was no rules on any of that in baseball then so they would look at that in between innings but what your Schembechler brought into bit you know into baseball one last thing that was real interesting and you you can you guys can debate this people can debate this I heard Sparky and Bo going back and forth about in baseball they call the guy in charge the manager that's right. In every other sport, the guy's a coach. And Bo was going on and on. He says, Sparky, why the heck do you call yourself a manager? You're a coach. You're coaching these guys. And Sparky was saying, you know, well, it's history. It's tradition. It's, you know, I'm moving guys around. It was just an interesting conversation why baseball calls their leader a manager. In football and basketball, he's the coach. But that's my memorable minute. I like how uh... – they, they have to dress up in uniform, uh, the managers in the big league. You know, a Bo, all, all those things, that those are uh, those are good things. You know, Bo gets ripped a lot for for firing Ernie Harwell. What do, what do you know about that? I tell you what, I was down there then. I was working down there then, and, and, and what I learned about that was the power of the media. And, you know, that was a uh, – there, there's a lot of stuff that – there's a lot of things that people don't know about that situation. I'm not going to bring it up, but there's things I just can't. I don't want to bring it up, Denny, but I know well, I mean, that, that the the thing that um, you know I, I've asked a, a number of people about this. The, the the thing that I think that went on is that you know the upper management, the ownership, you know, they were ready to move on. So you know, Bo was the guy, and Bo said, "Hey, I'll do it." Not that it was Bo's idea, like, "Hey, let's go ahead and you know get rid of Ernie." The Tigers yeah. wanted to get rid of Ernie, and you know, Bo came in, you know, and, and he was the one that did it. So he gets blamed for it. I don't know if he went to bat for him or not, 
But yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think there, what, from my interpretation of it, there, there was a marketing guy who was under Bo, and he was instrumental, I think, more than anybody, was the guy that was in charge of the marketing, the advertisers, because the advertisers were, you know, they were involved with things that were, it, they were involved with that decision. And, and I think, you know, a typical Bo, he delegated a lot to his, uh, you know, the people under him. But yeah, that story, I, I unless I hear it, you know, unless we hear it from, uh, but the, you know, from those, those people themselves, but they're in the grave, we'll probably never know the truth. But I think obviously there's two sides to that story. And I did see how the media, you know, you it, when one of their guys gets stung, boy, they come to defend their guy. <laughs> I saw that down at Tiger Stadium. Uh, Scarcelli uh, waiting on the uh, three-two. Here is uh, Morris. He uh, kicks and delivers, and Scarcelli looks at uh, one too many, and he is called out for excessive window shopping. <laughs> That's all I got for you here today, Scar. Great job, great stories, and uh, hopefully we'll talk with you on Saturday after Michigan wins in East Lansing. Go blue. We're ready to roll. Go get those Spartans. <laughs>